everybody, let's uh, let's get started just with some very quick announcements for uh, for us all. So welcome. It's it's great to to see you this morning. I'm Brent Never. I am a director of the Midwest Center for Nonprofit Leadership, and uh, really really excited to talk to you today about fundraising and some of the the issues that are going on, opportunities and challenges here in our region. I just wanted to tee up right now. Uh, our spring nonprofit conference is going to be in a virtual format, and it's going to be on April 1st. It's not a joke. It's not April Fools. We're really going to do it on April 1st. So uh, I want you all to just have that in the back of your mind. Um, Mark Culver here at the Midwest Center is uh, already putting that in our weekly uh, newsletter that we send out. So we would love to see as, as many of you all as, as could come and also people from your, your organizations too. So um, in the virtual format, we're able to have uh, a lower uh, cost to attend and it's a, a great way for you to, um, to get some development uh, if you would like. Uh, this time around, we're talking about the nonprofit workforce. Um, for those of you living through the great resignation, um, this is a perfect time for us to talk about generational shifts in our workforce, best practices. Um, we're going to have Jeannie Bell, uh, who is a national uh, speaker, uh, present to us on April 1st. Um, so with that, let's, let's get started in the interest of time. Let me give you uh, just the layout of, of what we're going to do. So this is a one hour session. Uh, I guarantee that we'll, we'll hit the mark for, for one hour. Uh, we'll have about 35 minutes of, of me uh, giving you some, some background ideas of, about what's going on in, in our region. Um, and then we'll be able to turn it over to everybody for some, some questions and discussions. Along the way, if you have any questions, please go ahead, pop them in the chat. Uh, Cindy Lawfer, our colleague here at the Mid Midwest Center is going to um, interrupt me if there's, if there's really good questions that need to be answered right now, um, very topical questions, but uh, also she'll be able to sort of group those questions for that question and answer period so that we're able to, to get to everybody's um, information. So with that, Cindy, I think did I did I miss anything? We're we're good, perfect. All right. So it's just so wonderful to see you all. For those of you who who don't know me, um, I am pretty new to the role of director of the Midwest Center. For those of you who haven't attended a, a navigation series in a little bit, you might be doing a head head spin kind of deal where uh, you say, well, you know, Dave Renz was was there for for 30 years, um, and we're so grateful to, to Dave. Dave is still involved with the Midwest Center quite heavily, um, so Dave is, is still here. Scott Helm was in the role for, for a few months also, and we're, we're very thankful to Scott for providing that leadership. Um, he's moved on to Children's Mercy, so um, so now I'm, I'm taking up the reins. I've been an associate professor at uh, the Henry w. w. Block School of Management for 12 years now. So uh, all that time I've been involved with Midwest Center. I've been lurking in the background. Maybe uh, I've worked with quite a few of you uh, in various roles, but I, I love working with students, uh, especially. It's one of my passions. So um, if, if you ever have uh, questions, or if you have good young people you think should should get some training, I'd, I'd love to, to help out. But I do want to talk today about um, uh, about this this idea of creating a sustainable pool of, of donors. So so this picture here, um, I think first off is a, a beautiful picture. Um, these are rice patties in in Nepal. Um, and so when I was trained, I was trained in, in economics. Um, and for those of you who then shake your head with all these horrible memories of economics class when you were in school, you know, um, I'm, I'm not going there as far as, you know, diagramming things. But 
you know, the person who trained me uh, was was really passionate about creating sort of flexible, sustainable systems to make sure that everybody succeeds. So the metaphor and what she studied was rice paddies. And if you think about rice paddies, just to plant the seed in your mind, they're fed by water, right? So rice grows in, in water. Um, and in rice paddies, the, the owner of the paddy at the top of the hill gets the most water. And then the one down gets a little less water and another down gets less water until the person at the bottom gets the least amount of water. And the person at the top gets to control the destiny of everybody at the bottom. Well, in Nepal, they've created these voluntary systems of trading ownership over time. So every year you move down one paddy on the hill. And then when you're at the bottom, next year you'll get to be at the top. And what that means is that you have every incentive to be good to somebody because you know that next time you could be at the bottom. Um, and this is completely voluntary. There's no government that's telling them what to do. And I just think it's really kind of a cool concept. Um, so this is a call to comment. And we're going to talk about that today. Um, as, as background, and if you guys are, are interested, the person who came up with this in, in my uh, dissertation chair was the only woman ever to win the Nobel Prize. So she won the Nobel Prize in economics um, for this idea of voluntary solutions to, to commons problems, all right? So uh, if you're interested, we, we can talk about that, but let's talk about fundraising. I know you, you all are, are um, involved in, in this and it's, it's really important. So today's agenda, um, I'm going to set the stage a bit about some data of, of what's happening in, in fundraising, um, some opportunities and some, some challenges right now. Uh, I'm going to sort of do a pivot to get you guys to think about donors as fish. Um, so, you know, there are big fish, there's the Mark Zuckerberg whale out there that some people are, are looking for just like Moby Dick. Um, there's some people who are looking at getting a million sardines through micro, micro campaigns, you know, text star 7777 and donate $7. Those are the sardines. And, and really trying to think about how we create uh, an ecosystem of fish that's healthy, that has a, a churn that's, that, that's sustainable. And we'll talk about that. And then we're going to talk about implications in the Kansas City region for how we can create a, a system that's going to allow for all the fish to grow, to be healthy, for all of us to, to be able to, to sustainably fish from, from that pool um, and ultimately have a, a healthier sort of ocean as, as far as the metaphor goes. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and let's, let's talk about some of the, the really interesting numbers. So this is the, the Giving USA report. Um, for those of you who, who use it, it's an absolutely wonderful resource um, put out by the Giving USA Foundation. So I, I highly encourage you to look up Giving USA. Um, every year they compile a national report. They actually present that uh, report here in the re region. Um, and, uh, and I, I encourage you to, to use that. So you look at this chart and uh, it's showing really wonderful things happening in, in the world of philanthropy. Uh, over the course of 40 years, our, uh, our giving to philanthropy has gone up absolutely at an amazing rate. Um, and as you can see, there, there are a couple of years here and there where it's, it's more or less Flat, but you know the overall all uh, gross trend is is absolutely wonderful. You you look at the current dollars; those are the little uh, dots. Those those are um, today's dollars, and then more importantly, you look at the bars, and those are inflation adjusted dollars. So you can kind of compare what 1985 looked like to today. Those are absolutely amazing. Um, numbers, particularly the 2020 number was our, our COVID year number. 
and giving went up by a significant amount even in our, our COVID year. So um, the, the trends are absolutely a, a wonderful story. But there's always a but, there's a catch, right? Because for those of you in, in the field, you might say, well, that's great, but it's not feeling so generous right now. Let's, let's look at another chart here. So this is kind of how giving is, is going up or down by the various uh, sort of institutions or ways we, we give. So uh, in a total aggregate amount, we give about 5% more. We gave about 5% more from 2019 to 2020. Uh, from 2018 to 2019, it was 4.7% more. So that's a, a tremendous trend. Over two years, giving went up by 10%, inclusive of, of a COVID year. Um, now you look at individual giving, and that's uh, sort of the topic of today. Uh, we see the individual giving in, in the pre-COVID year, 2018 to 2019, went up by 6.7%. Uh, in the, the COVID year, it went up by 2.2%. What we also see is foundation giving uh, went up a tremendous amount during that COVID year. And, and I think that's a great story. You know, um, I think that many charitable foundations found a way to dip into their endowments um, a little bit more than they, they had done previously to, to give. Um, also, we, we end up seeing that um, foundations had tremendous uh, financial years. Uh, even though 2020, I think we can all admit was pretty miserable for all of us as, as families and individuals. Uh, it was a good financial year and, and foundations were able to, um, to give more. Bequests went up quite a bit in, in our COVID year. Corporate giving went down and you can imagine that, that um, corporations were quite stressed in, in our COVID year. Um, so why do I show this? All right, so I show this for a couple of reasons because I, I want to tease out a couple of national trends that, that I think are particularly important for our region. Uh, the first trend is, is a generational trend. Um, I, I see my, my friend Gene Wilson on here and, and um, you know, I, I worked with Gene through, through the years on um, work with agencies that, that work on aging. And as you know, uh, baby boomers are, are aging um, at a, uh, an amazing rate. The number used to be 10,000 a day. We're, we're turning 65. I'm not sure if, if that's even increased, um, but we are aging as a society. What that means in the giving world is that more people are, are reaching an age where uh, they can think about charitable giving, particularly if you think about how people uh, approach their estates. So I'm talking about middle-class donors, but, but certainly upper, upper middle-class donors and, and above, they are at a time where they have to think about how they move money out of their retirement savings into other ways of, of shielding themselves from, from tax implications. I know that sounds boring, but this is a really important trend, guys. Um, what it means is that um, we find a, a, a huge increase in donor advised funds. So we have an absolutely wonderful community foundation here in the region. Um, they are, are growing um, in their donor advised funds. It's a way of shielding your wealth from taxes, but also it's a way of, of giving back. Also, you think about the, the big um, sort of firms that are, are involved in, in donor advised funds. So Fidelity Charitable comes to mind right now. Um, they are growing almost exponentially in, in um, money and um, in corpus, I should say. So I really, you know, we have to think about um, that tier of, of people who have the wealth to give are giving much more, all right? So you see that showing up in the individual numbers, and then you see that showing up in the foundation numbers, all right? So 
um, the that's that's absolutely essential. You see in the bequest numbers also um, that sort of trend. Uh, what we see deeper in the numbers, though, and this is is what I want us to to plant in our mind, is that middle class donors and working class donors are giving a significant amount less. And that is hidden by our top line number, right? So we look at this top line number of what's happening happening nationally, and we, we're very excited about it. But when we look below the waterline, we see that the, you know, the, the core of the generous America over, over a century um, are giving a lot less to, to charity. So that's the subject of, of today. Um, to think about, well, what, what's happening and what, what can we do about it? I want to put one more data point out there, and this seems like a, a non sequitur, and you say, well, Brent, why are you going there? Um, social media use, all right? So I just want to put this in your mind, and then we'll get to it. But uh, for those of you uh, in your organizations where you have social media campaigns, um, you're trying to, to think about how you engage people, whether it's Facebook or, or Twitter, you know, now uh, we, we have TikTok is, is the newest darling in the social media world. So how do you create a 30 second video that goes viral uh, on, on TikTok is, is absolutely something that I know my students at UMKC are, are talking about and, and thinking about. What I wanna say is that you look at these numbers of how many US adults use these various social media channels daily. This is Pew Research. So this is real good, solid research. You, if you Google it, you'll find a lot of research that I don't hold as much you know, uh, credence to. But you see that you know, almost 70% of people are logging into Facebook every single day. So that's your, all the way from your, your grandparent down to your eight-year-old kid, whether they should be on Facebook or not. Um, why I say that is let's just think about how we used to solicit donations from people. Back, say, 30 years ago, we would maybe pick up a phone. We may put a, a flyer in the mail. Think about how many times people ask, access their mailbox, at most once a day. Think about how many times people access their Facebook or their Twitter. You know, it can be dozens of times a day. So if you are soliciting using these channels, you might say, wow, look at how many more eyeballs are getting on my, my message. But think about the fact that everybody else has that logic too. So we are contacting people at a prodigious rate compared to the way we, we contacted people 30 years ago. And this is, this is a trend I wanna talk about today. Uh, Diane had a good question. I wanna to get to it real, real quick. She, she asked, do you have demographic info on giving? And we do. Um, so it's a little bit buried, Diane. What we can look at from a, class numbers and looking at the Giving USA report, remember I said middle class donors and, and uh, working class donors are down. What we can surmise from that is where people traditionally have given in those classes. So for example, religious giving was um, the, the largest part of the pie in American giving and working class and middle class donors traditionally gave the most to religious giving and religious giving is down double digits in the past decade. Um, so that's our clue to say that something in this pattern is, is fundamentally changing in, in that. What we find though is higher ed giving and um, giving to, to healthcare, mostly hospitals and, and endowments for hospitals are going up. Um, at prodigious rates. And those tend to be numbers that upper middle class and, and above uh, give to. So those are our, our, our points that we look at to say what's sort of the breakdown of, of how this is happening. In the Giving Re uh, USA report, they also break it down by, by age, race, and, and um, otherwise. And again, I, I 
totally hope that you you all look up um, giving USA. All right, so let's let's think about how to how we've traditionally thought about giving. We've thought about it as this private transaction between a donor and um, in, in an organization, a charity, right? Uh, here's a, a terribly dated um, image, you know, it, it's dated in all sorts of, of ways, but, you know, it, it was that idea that uh, you would have this, this personal connection between a, a, a donor again in, in their agency. And there's all sorts of great reasons why this, this was a, a hallmark of American philanthropy. Um, first off, we, we created relationships. So it was this, this person became, you know, uh, they understood better their community through this relationship. They understood the, the needs of kids, of older adults, of, you know, people with mental illness, whatever it was through creating this relationship. Um, and, and that creates that positive social capital that we all want, right? So we, we of course, need the, the funds to keep our mission going. And I, I don't begrudge that one bit. But when you add it all up, traditionally, American philanthropy was this wonderful story of creating these, these connections to, to community. And it, we did it in several ways. You know, we, we did have those individual contacts where uh, it was a mail solicitation, somebody got involved. Maybe it was your neighbor was on a board or volunteered for an organization and therefore you, you became understanding of that organization. But, you know, we had wonderful things like federated campaigns, the United Way, uh, the Jewish Federation, um, those are just American success stories over, over a century. And I can't you know, state enough how important the United Way was to getting working class and middle class donors into the culture of philanthropy. You could work at a steel mill, steel mill and have a United Way campaign. And that was your entrance point into, into giving. And that is just you know, something that, that I, I think so highly of. Um, you think about tithing in faith institutions. There's many faith traditions where, you know, part of your, your tithing to your, whether it's a church, synagogue, mosque, um, that was partly your ministry, right? That was how you gave. And, um, and again, that is, it remains the biggest part of American giving in, in our national trends, but that trend is, is shrinking quite a bit. Lastly, uh, we have community foundations. And that is uh, traditionally, it's been for uh, people with a, a little more to give. Um, it, it might be $10,000 or, or above. So that was traditionally a little bit out of the reach of, of many middle-class families and, and working-class families. But these are absolute uh, wonderful things. I know I'm, I'm going on and on about how much I, I think of these uh, types of institutions, but let's, let's also um, talk about some of these trends in these institutions. Now, uh, I think very, very highly of our, our local United Ways, um, but you know, nationally, the trend is giving to United Way over a generation has, has gone, gone down. Um, there's many reasons in, in the literature about that, uh, whether it's people working in the gig economy who don't have workplace giving, whether it's people who've retired and, and don't, aren't in a workplace. Um, you know, there's also generational explanations about, you know, maybe millennials don't want to give in that way. I, I hold less, less to that, but I think there's, there's a discussion to be had. Faith institutions, you see people going less to church, synagogue, mosque than ever before. So, so attendance to faith institutions is, is uh, down. Um, and then community foundations, though, uh, but also donor advised funds, as I said, are going up almost exponentially. Um, so what we find, again, is, is 
you know, a, a class divide of how different people are able, able to give. So um, here's what I, I want you guys to sort of think about. Here's, here's the, the big idea. So I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie, A Beautiful Mind. Um, it's about John Nash. Uh, you know, it's, it's an absolute great movie. Uh, John Nash was an economist. It's a great movie because he has all those squigglies behind him and you don't have to understand the squigglies on the, on the chalkboard um, to, to find it to be a, a really interesting uh, story. But John Nash, uh, he won the Nobel Prize uh, in economics. And, and the reason why he won the Nobel Prize is a very simple concept that I know you live every day and I live every day. And, and the concept is, is this. We all know that in various ways, if we cooperated, we would have a better outcome. So I'll use the example of, of my neighbor, neighborhood. I live in Midtown, uh, Kansas City. Absolutely love my, my neighborhood. I know that if everybody in our neighborhood picked up litter, all right, or engaged in community watch or whatever, whatever it was, we would all be better off for, for that, right? Um, but we all have individual incentives also. We have the individual incentive of, hey, you know, the Chiefs are playing tonight and, uh, or my daughter has a recital or any other of a myriad sort of, you know, need out there. And therefore, you know, we don't go in and uh, pick up the litter or join the community, the neighborhood watch or, or whatever it is. So his idea is that um, individual incentives trump uh, group incentives. And uh, in, in a myriad of ways, you, you see that on the highways, you know, you always complain. I always complain about those darn drivers that are speeding you know, or driving dangerously, but, you know, then when it comes to, hey, I'm late for, for my daughter's doctor's appointment, I'm speeding also. So um, in, in the context of, of fundraising though, uh, what I want us to do is start to think about the moving from a private transaction level of how we interact between a singular donor and our organization to think about what's the macro implications. So we in, in the fundraising field talk about stewardship, about sustainability, about the need to, to steward donors in, a, in an ethical sort of way. And I know that we all believe it. I, this is not a critique. I, I believe it, we all believe that. But when it comes down to it, often there, there are needs that your organization has. You have to fund your, your programs because you do excellent work for, for your community. And when it comes to, you know, attracting a donor, um, you know, it, it, it's important that, that you, you get that, that donor, um, even if you don't want to, to kind of be uh, un, unethical about it. Definitely don't want to be unethical. But, but here's the implications. We in our fundraising have bigger nets. So we have social media campaigns. We used to send out, you know, and we still do send out mail solicitations. And, and I still get those. I know you do around the, the holiday time, around Giving Tuesday. You know, we still have our mailbox full of, of individual solicitations. But oftentimes we have social media campaigns with the idea that they're they're reaching you know a much wider audience we have micro giving which uh i, I talked about the star 7777 and give seven dollars to the american red cross um sort of these these very quick giving uh campaigns we have viral giving um everybody wants the new ice bucket challenge that's where TikTok comes in and you 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 know try to create some sort of way that, that it catches on. Um, we also have, and I think really importantly, non-charitable giving. Uh, we, we also call that mutual aid, 
uh, you know, we're, we're part of a, a faith institution in my family. We're also part of a, a school community. We're, we're consistently getting asked via GoFundMe campaigns for this family was, you know, evicted from their home. Can you, can you kick in, you know, whatever you can to get them rehoused? Um, you know, uh, this, this home burned down or, or whatever might have happened. So Go, GoFundMe is not technically or always charitable giving, but certainly it's giving to the, the greater good. Um, and and we're, we're all being influenced by it. We have better radar, so or better sonar, I, I should say. So we have great donor databases. Uh, for those of you in fundraising, I'm sure that you use uh, some of the, the donor databases out there to understand who gives, where they give, how they give, um, so that you're better able to say, over here, you know, we, we want to attract this, this donor in, in this demographic. We have social media analytics. So if you guys use Facebook or Google analytics, um, you can really uh, target and understand where your, your fish are or where your donors are. And then we have better spears to understand spear fishing where you're going after one fish is micro-targeting of donors to say that uh, Cindy Smith is, she loves animals. She's, you know, of an age where she's, she's thinking about her estate and we were, we're going to, you know, attract Cindy Smith. So if you think about um, these, these various ways of, of being more effective at, at attracting donors, um, these, you know, largely didn't exist in, in previous generations. You know, we did have databases, they weren't nearly as robust. Now we have all of these tools that allow us to be better fishermen or fisherwomen. But the real problem is the fact that we still have the same ocean that we're fishing from. And so this is, is uh, something that that we have to consider because if we're all out there with bigger nets um, and we're all feeling that we have to get our net in the water before the next organization gets their net in the water, if we all have that incentive, then we're going to ultimately create an unsustainable cycle of people getting hit up more and more by solicitations and people turning off those solicitations more and more. I didn't give you two data points, but they scare the pants off of me. One data point is volunteering nationally is down significantly. We have had ever since the National Corporation of, of uh, Public Service, and now it's called AmeriCorps, ever since they've been collecting data, it's been an upward trend in volunteering over time. That trend has reversed. And that's not a COVID year trend. That is two years before COVID hit volunteering is starting to go down. Secondly, um, they collect information about giving by state. And I always think about Utah. Um, Utah has been the state where volunteerism and uh, giving has always been the highest in the country. Uh, you can think of, of the reasons why uh, I think, you know, faith giving and faith uh, volunteerism is, is very strong in Utah. In Utah is the canary in the coal mine. Their volunteerism and their, their giving is down. And so we're trying to think about what this means implications for, for our region um, in, in nationally. So if we think of fishing as, as something where we have better spears, we have better sonar, we have better nets, let's think about promising practices, all right? So um, when we think about promising practices, and I'll, I'll bring in that, the economist who, who won the Nobel Prize, um, because these, these really uh, work. Um, one is how do we educate donors about the broad array of services that 
several different organizations provide. So say you work in the field of mental health um, services. So previously we've had the incentive to educate the, don uh, the, the um, individual donors about what your organization does so that you can attract um, those donors. Mm -hmm. What if um, we had some incentivizing from, from regional funders to say, we're going to create a campaign where we tell you know, um, the community about these five, don't, these five organizations in this field so that people can understand that this organization works with people um, in South Kansas City. And this organization works with veterans. And this organization does great work with, um, with, with families. Um, so that we can get out of this sense of, we need to get our message out first to people, instead to create a collective message and then give a, a channel for people to give to this, um, to this group. Um, or to this, uh, you know, a group of, of organizations. Secondly, we're, we're thinking a lot about creating uh, seed, seed money or pools um, to augment the smaller fish. And, and I don't, you know, I don't say that disparagingly, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a small fish as, as a giver also. Um, but how do we create pools of funding that individuals can use to multiply their, their giving. So uh, some people are lucky, lucky enough to work uh, for employers that have matching you know, systems. The vast majority of us don't have access to those systems. Uh, how do we have uh, a system that uh, we're going to have funders uh, allow people to choose the organizations they want and to multiply their, their um, ability to give. If people aren't accessing the United Way as they, they used to, and I, I want to be part of them accessing the United Way, um, how can we augment the ability of, of those donors to become bigger fish, but also to become part of this positive social capital? Right? How do we get them into the system so that they, they understand that their connection to their community is very important no matter what they give? Because right now we're, we're chasing fish out of, out of the system. Um, and then how do we create a, a, a better way of sharing our, our data about how we, we give? So how do we create smaller groups of organizations where their giving data is shared amongst each other so that they understand that how can we steward this group of fish as a group of five organizations so that they can be better connected to, to our organizations. So I know this is sort of pie in the sky for some of you and you say, that's really nice, Mr. Professor, but you know, this, we have needs. This is a regional dialogue that, that we, um, we need to think about, all right? So uh, really we want to uh, create a, a system where we're going to have donors involved in, um, in, in with, with foundations and funders in creating systems where people have voice, where people are going to engage and we're going to create that positive social capital. So let's go ahead. We're going to open it up for, for questions in, in dialogue right now. Um, we also have in, in the box that, that Mark Culver put up, and I think he'll, he'll put in the chat one more time for those of you who didn't get access to it. We have some thought questions that, that I want you to, um, to think about. Um, also, the slide deck is, is in there. Uh, is, you know, a, a shameless plug. We're writing a book about this right now. Um, so this this book uh, is with uh, two other scholars, one at BYU, Rob Christensen, and one at University of Massachusetts. Um, we all studied with with this economist 
Um, and we're all diving deep into best practices of, of how this could work. So with that, uh, happy to take your, your questions. Brent, I will just throw it out real quick. So we did have a question about just donor databases and stuff. And I thought maybe since we do have so many people on the call today, um, obviously we'd love your your thoughts. One person did mention Razor's Edge as, as an option, but if there's other you know options out there or some really favorites that people are using, um, you know, people use everything from Razor's Edge and other high-end softwares to Excel, but just what if people want to share with what they're doing on that. Absolutely. Please, yeah, throw it in, in the chat. Um, so let's, let's uh, I also uh, want to put up our, our thought questions just so that, that we, can, we can tease those out. So let me move it over here real quick and, and share the screen. Boomerang, perfect. Um, wonderful. These are wonderful tools. Um, they really, they really are wonderful tools. So, uh, if what I would would encourage you to do with with your team at your your organization is to sort of work through some of these questions. So, who are the individual donors who are currently giving to my organization? Uh, what's their profile? How often do we quote unquote touch them? What are our touch points? How do we, we engage them? Um, you know, so many of us try to have multiple touch points and, and be very thoughtful about these campaigns. And that's absolutely a wonderful instinct. But then I want you to think, who are the donors I would like to attract to give to my organization? So who are the, you know, to use the analogy, the fish um, that we haven't been able to, to quote unquote catch or to, to be less, you know, into that? How, how do we at least educate people in these, these other groups? Um, and to what other causes do these pool of people give? That's where Razor's Edge, for example, Boomerang, they, they all come in and they, they help you understand patterns in, in giving. Because here's the trick question, and I think this is, is the trick question that, that's a natural one. Uh, we teach a fundraising series here at the Midwest Center. And the natural question is, how do I attract the donations before the other causes attract those donations, right? It's, it's natural. Uh, here at the university, I, I'm involved in fundraising for, for you know, the Midwest Center or for, for the block school. We also have those discussions. So how do you, you know, for you and maybe how do we create this campaign that attracts eyeballs or, or this uh, viral campaign, or maybe we'll do that, that micro campaign. But the better question that I, I, I hope that that you all are, are looking to think about is, could we educate donors to the range of programs and services that the organizations in our field deliver and therefore create this system where we're going to collectively fish together um, and steward that positive social capital that's going to add to uh, the, the donations over, over time, meaning having stronger fish over, over time. So if I've yammered on, um, let's see here. Are there any questions? Brent, we do have one question from David, um, Dave Renz. Um, so how about the relevance of collective impact works in this environment, particularly ecosystems Oops, sorry, my thing. Particularly ecosystems working to address wicked problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's it's a great question, and and you know, uh, Dave at at um, the Midwest Center, we we love having these questions. We we kind of bat them around all the time, and collective impact is one of those absolute promising practices. You know, to to think about how you create these. Uh, these networks of, of folks with a, a central sort of convening organization that can help to, uh, to solidify those, those trusting relationships. Those are wonderful um, 
wonderful ways of, of thinking about it. So again, collective impact is uh, a way of, of having a, a tent pole organization or central convening organization that's able to, to broker this, this positive uh, trusting set of relationships in, in a group. It's, it's something that we all uh, are involved with at various levels in, in our, our networks around, around the community. Um, but having a, a fundraising community that, that's built around these, I think is, is a, a promising practice. Um, and it's hard because we have to trust these folks and we have to trust them to, to also uh, not take the, the information we're giving and then go spearfish the people, you know, we're, we're trying to, to fish. Others. Yeah. So Brent, so this is, this concept is sort of counterintuitive to fundraising. We don't, you know, we're hesitant to share our prospect list, our donors. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you, how can nonprofits move closer to that, that collaboration piece? The pressure is always, you know, on something about my goals and that's what people have to answer to. So how do we get to that collaboration? Yeah, Cindy. And, and that's such an excellent point. And I don't want to sugarcoat it one bit. So I absolutely understand that you all do amazing work for your organizations and your communities. I see so many names on here and I nod my head and think, I love that organization. I love what they're, they're doing. So I do not want to, um, to get away from that message. And when we're convening regional discussions and we are starting to convene those discussions, that's the first message, right? So the first message is, this is not about fundraisers and their incentive and and their actions because um, you know what you do is so essential. That being said, it is totally counterintuitive. Um, and what the promising practices show, whether it is rice patties in Nepal or whether it's uh, governing uh, logging in in the Amazon. Um, the best practices show that if you have a convener that that incentivizes people to to um, produce and push out information as a group, you end up having more income for that group, and you end up having more sustainable outcomes. All right, so that's been shown over and over again um, in in the environmental literature. So. Um, it's something that, that I want us to talk about in, in this region. Um, Brent, so what about a new organization, someone just starting out, and how do they kind of start to talk to donors? Um, and I'm going to put a little of my addition here, but partly what, what are the important things to, um, to include as you start to reach out to donors, and what are the things that maybe a new, a, a tiny new organization would want to focus on to and, and you know impress, for lack of a better word, uh, the donor. Yeah, so I think I think there's two levels, and and so the first the first level is, you know, it is important to educate the community about what you're doing and why it's important. There's more need than what we're able to give, right? So we want to to give more uh, as as agencies. We need to scale up. So you need to, to be able to articulate that this is this is how we're going to, you know, approach this this community need. But don't let that uh, you know education pull you over the edge of saying this is why we are better than the next organization. Um, I would like us all to frame it as this is the suite of of experiences and services that these six organizations, including my new one, are able to provide. And this is the whole range that we're, we're working in. And we encourage you, Mr. or Ms. Donor, to think about how, if you're passionate about, you know, mental health care for veterans, that's my organization and this is how it works. But if you're passionate about mental health care for older adults, this is the other organization that's, that's working in that field. And therefore to create this common dialogue across those five organizations when approaching donors so that they know that this, this is an ecosystem 
that we are all, you know, giving and, and working towards. Um, just a comment, I think on more than anything, Brent, but um, if, if, if an organization is truly donor centric, um, it's sort of on the, um, the organization to share, you know, how they can fulfill their, the donor's mission um, by doing that. So it's kind of on the donor of that. So, I mean, in that, in that perfect world, it would work that way um, for the, the nonprofit to, to, to reach out to the donor in that way. Um, also, Ed um, Seen, Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, he wants to go ahead and unmute and ask a question um, himself. So go ahead, Ed. Edwards. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, so I've attended a number of, of various seminars like this about uh, fundraising. And the what I sense is that the model that these presentations use is social service, um, health care, you know, other kinds of, of uh, nonprofit service providers, um, and rarely touch on the the special issues of the performing, you know, of the arts, um, yeah. the performing yeah. arts. And uh, you know, uh, I see one of my peers um, here in town, and I, I'll just use myself. So I work for the Lyric Opera of Kansas City, and um, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I I assume that pretty much zero people will give even $10 to the opera if they haven't attended an opera and don't at least like it a little bit. And so there's a whole, there's a lot of things in edu public education, music education, arts education, thing, and then leading up to people being having the wherewithal to, to go and become fond of the art form. All that has to take place before we can even um, begin to think about some of these issues. Um, and our audiences are dwindling and it's, it's a real challenge. So that's probably too big a question for a few minutes, but. No, I absolutely uh, appreciate it and, and love it. And, and uh, we're as a family very involved in, in performing arts. So it's, it's a passion we personally have. I also agree with your comment that, you know, it's so important to have people actually touch the art form, be there um, to, to understand it. And I will give a, a, a shout out to our local performing arts organizations who have, and I forget the name of the campaign, but it's kind of, uh, if, you, if you're a subscriber to one organization's you know, season, then you, you get access to a, a free companion ticket to another organization's season. And, and that's sort of what I'm talking about um, in that you uh, approach it to say, here's 20 options in performing arts, and they're all wonderful and necessary to the vitality of our community. And we know you love the lyric opera, and I bet you would also love the symphony, the ballet, the, you know, name the other, other organization. And it's a way of saying, this is thinking about performing arts as a suite of important lifestyle, you know, or, or not even lifestyle, but important services to, to the vitality of our region. And we would love for you to give to the lyric, but if you give to the ballet, that's a, a win too, because you're, you're now in this ecosystem. And so I, I think that your particular challenges are, are important also. Um, to, to what we're talking about, yeah. Brent, um, just, you've talked about this, but I just, the question just came in real recently. So I kind of want to just make sure that there's nothing else we should say, but funders are going to be key in that collaboration piece. And do you have just any thoughts on how nonprofits can help funders, help drive funders to the collaboration piece? The yes, other ones I, that that's such a great question. I, and, and I think that this is really, going to have to be a regional dialogue that's that's going to occur over a long period of time, right? So this is not something where, hey, Brent did a cute little navigation series for an hour and, and problem solved. Not at all, guys. Um, this is something where we're going to have to have, uh, you know, people like yourselves from, from various organizations, then we're going to have to have uh, federated campaigns, whether it's United Way, the you know Jewish Federation, and the like, 
um, we're going to have to have the community foundation involved as well as I think regional funders are going to um, really want to be involved in how do we, we talk about growing giving? How as a region do we amplify this, um, this dialogue? And also as funders, how can we incentivize organizations to take that leap? to go ahead and go in as a group of, of five or 10 organizations together. Cause that's, you're going to have to incentivize it. You're going to have to take away some of the risk to make it work. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for funders to, to really change um, the dialogue within a smaller networks of organizations and then move, move on. Um, a couple other concepts of giving that people just are curious of how that connects to what you're, you're talking about today. So one is um, giving circles, how that connects to this, this, this idea, and then also giving days or 24-hour, you know, focused cycles of giving and that type of thing, how those kind of connect to this. So Rebecca, giving circles are a passion of mine. I, you know, I am so in on, on giving circles. Now they're hard. So for those of you, I imagine a lot of you know giving circle, but if you don't, it's it's no no big deal. Uh, giving circle is, uh, I'll, I'll give you the image of it's it's a group of maybe 10, 12 friends or or colleagues who who break bread. Oftentimes there's you know a bottle of wine or or God knows what. Um, where every month you you pop in a, a certain amount as an individual. Maybe it's $25. You go to somebody's house as a group, you decide this month we want to support, you know, an organization that's working on mental health care with, with kids. Um, and therefore you uh, collectively all have $25 each and you give in that way. It's great for social capital. Could you talk about the organizations? You talk about what they, they do and why, you know, it would be great to, to do that it multiplies the, the giving um, and it, it's just on the, on the fish side of things, such an ideal way of making it happen. There's problems though, they're very intensive. Um, you need to get a group of people together. You have to keep that group together and it's hard to scale. I think a promising practice is having uh, funders match giving circle gifts. Right, so a funder to say, okay, this giving circle, um, we're going to give a two to one match. You give $250 this, this month to an organization, we're gonna amplify it to $750 now. Um, that's a way of democratizing voice, right? So people who are only able to pop in $25 now have a larger voice. Um, and, and also have this reason to feel connected to these, these organizations and proud of that connection. So I love, I love giving circles, absolutely. That's, um, that, that concludes, I think, our questions and our, um, our time. So there is some comments in there. Um, I, some people just, FYI, just draw people to the, the chat. Um, there's a, how do we keep this going? What do we do now? And there's some ideas people are offering. So do check in with the chat on that. Of who's maybe talking about this already. Yeah, so I, I and I wanna thank you all. There's there's really great comments in here that I would love to um, to address also and in, in perhaps we can do it offline. Please go ahead and, and drop me a message, drop Cindy or, or Mark Culver a message also if, if you'd like, and um, you're doing wonderful work. I'm, I'm very proud of, of our region and, and what you all do. Um, have a great uh, Monday, or it's Tuesday, and um, we'll see you again next month for our next navigation series. Thank you.